Those react in the weightless environment. And we'll spin this particular bag as well. And you'll see the bubbles concentrating right in the geometric center. Now here we have a sequence of Walt putting on this rather large, lumpy suit, which became a rather annoying thing to us. And it was very uncomfortable to wear after the flight coveralls. And you'll notice the suit retains its <laughs> position somewhat. And it does sort of give you trouble fighting it. The suit weighs about 55 pounds on the surface of the Earth. As you can see, Walt is becoming properly dressed for the occasion. I'm also getting worried. <laughs> <laughs> now, we had fun with this. This film was originally shot at six frames a second, which gives us a Keystone cop routine. <laughs> we decided Walt should get out, and we reversed the film. <laughs> you can guess what his problem was, but we'll just leave that up in the air. <laughs> Now here we demonstrate the capability of handling our equipment and we bring the camera to a close. Now this particular shot is a shot of the number one window as I described on my side where some of the external debris from water dumps and urine dumps have collected on the outer pane. The demonstration we're trying to show to you here is that even as clear as these windows are, external objects that are with us in Earth orbit may collect on the spacecraft. Uh, from every flight we've had reports of objects that seem to <coughs> come off the uh, exterior of the spacecraft, and this is what we've seen, finally, on the window itself. Well, this particular shot, I think we're about 25 feet away. Now, after a rather great amount of work that was done to accomplish this rendezvous, Don Isley got us in the position where I could decelerate and come back and see the booster again. This is the S-4B as we see it after the rendezvous was completed. Now, Walt, I think you should describe this one. You were nearer to it. This is the picture, one of the very best we took, of uh, Hurricane Gladys that was sitting in the Gulf of Mexico during the flight. And it, uh, I guess it was the past before this, or I guess maybe the day before, that Wally gave a mark over the hurricane itself, and we became a weather satellite. And this pass was uh, just an exceptional one to be able to get a picture of the entire hurricane. Now, as we are world travelers, I thought we might take you around the world a little bit. And here you can see the complete tracing of the Suez Canal, all the way up to Port Said, the Gaza Strip, and Israel, and the Republic of Egypt. I think it's rather interesting to note, uh, particularly in our president's remarks and the work he has done to make our space program peaceful, that was the opportunities we had to fly between the latitudes of 31 north and 31 south. The world was very peaceful and very attractive to us. And I think we can show you that with some of these other slides. Here we are over the Ganges River of India and the Himalayas that were there a long time before Gordon Cooper went over. But Gordon Cooper is the one that had pictures of Himalayas from every different aspect, both on his Mercury and Gemini flights. And Mount Everest is up in this area, and the next one I think will show you the fantastic elevations of the Himalayas. It's one of the uh, dominant scenes for the first several days of the flight, is you always seem to have good daylight right over the Himalayas. And the picture you have right here, for example, there's the 12 tallest peaks in the world are all in that picture. And here is a picture of the Tibetan area. You notice the uh, snow line, that's about 18,000 feet. And the clarity of this is due to the fact that there's very little atmosphere from this surface up to where we are. And where our spacecraft started, as uh, shown in this slide, we are off the west coast, and you can find that we have the California area right there, Los Angeles, Palm Springs, Lake Tahoe, Las Vegas. And uh, you can see just a little bit of the smog that seemed to permeate the air over the Los Angeles area. And fortunately, we didn't have to take any of that with us in the spacecraft. Here we have Mobile Bay, Mobile itself, Brooklyn Air Force Base. Another generator of smoke is Birmingham. I would like to make note of the fact that from this you can see smoke in various areas coming through. And it shows what man can do to a beautiful climate by polluting the atmosphere. 
this is our classic victory at sea picture <laughs> of Florida. I think, Walt, you might describe how this one was taken. <laughs> <laughs> it shows there's no substitute for experience. We were, uh, we just departed the Houston area, running across the Gulf Coast, and it was kind of dim light, it was towards the end, and we were running out of film, and I was being kind of tight with it. And, well, he says, hey, there's a good picture, take it. And I says, oh, the light's no good. He says, shoot it. He says, they really go for that sunshine coming off the water. <laughs> <laughs> All I can say is he was 100% right. Next time I saw it was on the front page of uh, Florida paper. Two, one. On October 22nd, 259 hours and 39 minutes after liftoff, the service propulsion system performs retrofire and the faithful okay, service the module separates, separates from the command separate. module bearing the crew. Right. Apollo 7 re-enters across the southern United States, a glowing fireball. Its parachutes carry it to the primary recovery area in the ocean east of Florida. It comes to rest floating apex down in the condition known as stable two. The crew uprights it with special flotation bags that are carried just for that purpose. This is the actual Apollo 7 recovery, a basket ride to the waiting helicopter and then to the carrier Essex for a hero's welcome. That was seven decimal five. When word of the safe recovery gets back to Houston, the traditional cigars turn mission control into a smoke-filled room. Captain Sherrard, Colonel Isley, and Mr. Cunningham, your flight in the new Apollo spacecraft was one of the most successful space missions that's ever been undertaken. By this country or by any other country, and we just don't see how you could have done any better. I am told that you accomplished as many mission objectives, 56 of them, in this one flight as were accomplished in the first five manned flights of the Gemini spacecraft. You logged the most man hours ever in a single flight mission, more than 780 hours. This, incidentally, is more man hours than have been logged in all the Soviet man flights to date. They still lead us only in woman hours in space. <laughs> For nearly 11 days, much longer than is required to go to the moon and back, you operated this complex new spacecraft without a failure in any major system. In short, you prove beyond doubt that you were flying the world's most advanced and most versatile manned space vehicle. And I want to pay tribute here, too, to our private enterprise system and the industry that made that possible, as well as the scientists who provided that great leadership. You prove that the United States today leads in space accomplishments. This is not important as either a game or a contest. But it is important because the United States of America must be first in technology if it is to continue its position in the world. We're in the office of Dr. Homer Newell, Associate Administrator of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Does the Apollo experience open up any new avenues of technological spin-off from the space activities into other kinds of technological activities? Yes, I think it does. And in fact, although we often use the shorthand of saying we're going to get men to the moon and land them and bring them back safely as the objective of the Apollo program, in reality, the long-range objective is to stimulate the development of technology. And if you think a bit about it, you see that you have to solve problems in structures, in energy use, batteries, power supplies, the handling of information, the protection of men, the development of new environments under which to operate. You name the discipline, and it's 
almost certain that it has to be tackled at its very frontier in the Apollo program. And this just infuses into our ability to do other things on Earth. And I should emphasize in concluding that the ability to manage large-scale projects like this is going to be important in tackling problems of pollution, transportation, our cities, the food problem, and so on. Do you think the medical experiences of the astronauts will help us solve the common cold problem? Well, it certainly has highlighted the need for some attention to the problem. Thank you very much, Dr. Newell. It's my pleasure. It's November 13th, 1968, and this is our last entry in the log of Apollo 7. It's about one month after liftoff, and this is the Apollo 7 command module. It's back now at its birthplace, the Space Division of North American Rockwell at Downey, California. And the men who built it are now performing an autopsy. Last night, they removed the main heat shield, the aft heat shield down here that protected the structure against the temperature of reentry. And the structure down here has now been exposed. You can see there's some corrosion here. That's, that's from the ocean at the end of the ride. The Apollo has suffered a sea change. The heat shield itself has been moved to another position for examination. The outside surface, of course, is black and charred. It uh, had a temperature of more than 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Looks a bit like a mistake on my barbecue. As a matter of fact, in places, this structure is no thicker than a good hunk of sirloin. But the internal structure is still essentially intact. Here on the spacecraft, this mylar covering is the original. It rode all the way through the mission, all the way down through reentry. And the nozzles of the attitude control jets are in almost such perfect condition. Well, in principle, they could be used again. Inside the spacecraft, quite a bit of the equipment has been removed, but you can still see the display panel in the Cunningham position. And of course, the findings from all of this are still being sifted. But as of yesterday, NASA announced that on the basis of the spectacular success of Apollo 7 and together with the confidence in the overall Apollo system, it would be possible now for the next mission, that's Apollo 8, to plan as its ultimate goal having three Americans in orbit around the moon on Christmas. And considering that this is only the second man flight of Apollo, that's an impressive vote of confidence. Since we filmed the first entry in this log, the Earth has rotated 33 times on its axis, although Chirac and his crew saw roughly 165 orbital sunrises and sunsets, so that puts them well ahead of the rest of us. The wheel of American politics has turned its Republican face to the world. The Soviet Union has stepped up its space program, which indicates that the moon race may yet hold a few surprises. And oh yes, Jackie and Onassis captured the headlines for a few days. There's been change, progress, movement, now. And it's all symbolized by this, well, perhaps odd looking, but supremely efficient mechanism. So ready or not, moon, here we come. Now, there's just one last request I'd like to make of you. If you recall, when Shira and his companions were giving their orbital telecast, they held up a little card like this, and following it, bags and bags of mail poured into Houston. Well, we hope to continue this filmed log of the Apollo program all the way through the Apollo program, but we need your comments and your encouragement to make it possible. So please, write to me tonight. And tell me what you like about the program. And if you must, you can tell me what you didn't like about the program. Because only with your letters can we bring Apollo into your home on public television. A little closer, Wally. To keep those cards coming. Cards and letters cards coming in. Coming in, folks. It's loud and clear. Okay, let's take a look and see how New Orleans is this morning. Don't fall over there, Don.